Hi friends, welcome to Growing as Grown Ups, where we believe each of us has the opportunity to keep growing in ways that can fundamentally improve our life effectiveness, our leadership influence, and our well-being. Through interviews, stories, and practical principles, we explore how you can accelerate your growth and unlock your potential to make the difference you want to make. And now, your hosts from The Leaders Lyceum, Dr. Sarah Musgrove and Dr. Keith Eigel. Before we get into the episode, I wanted to just jump in here real quick and make sure you knew about our webinar that we are doing on January 22nd. So if you were listening to this on release week, you still have time to sign up. Join Keith and I live as we walk you through the Growth Gap tool that you can identify your own personal opportunities for growth for this coming year. Go to growinggrownups.com slash GGT webinar to sign up. And we hope to see you on Friday. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Growing as Grownups. Today, we have Keith's conversation with one of our favorite leaders, Kyle Marrero. Keith, why don't you tell us a little bit about Kyle? I mean, once we get into the podcast, people will learn some things about his early life. But Kyle is the president of Georgia Southern University, um, growing institution within our state. Um, has always been relatively large, kind of a, a step below Georgia and Georgia Tech. Came from West Georgia, where I got to meet him initially as president of West Georgia. Um, actually took that institution through a transformation that was recognized nationally. He's, he's just an amazing leader, um, which is crazy because he got his PhD in opera and he ran theaters and he is, uh, you know, and maybe, uh, maybe university life is like a good opera, but he is, um, <laughs> he, he has just been so incredible in this environment in terms of his transformational leadership. I mean, he's just such a great change leader, um, but he does it in ways that are so values based and you'll hear all this stuff come out in the interview. Um, the other thing that you'll hear come out in the interview is um, Kyle, Dr. Marrero, um, when I met him, was already someone who had done a really good job growing as a grown-up. Um, but, but my gosh, when he got hold of our curriculum, he just embraced it. And, and now he talks about bigger me values and smaller me values and worry, fear, and resistance. And so... Uh, folks, you're going to hear a lot of that stuff come up in this interview, but um, but uh, I, again, I, I hope you enjoy this. Kyle is absolutely one of my favorite leaders, one of our favorite leaders um, anywhere. All right. And while I was disappointed he did not sing for you, his uh, insights and stories and advice is just as inspirational. And so with that, let's hear your conversation with Dr. Kyle Marrero. All right, listeners, I am so excited to have Dr. Kyle Marrero with us today. He is absolutely one of my favorite higher education leaders. He's one of my favorite leaders. He's just so focused on growth. He's highly awarded across the country for just the kind of progressive work that he's put into higher education and, and, and bringing higher education into the 21st century. Kyle, welcome to the Growing as Grown Ups podcast. Thanks, Keith. Appreciate it. And uh, I was joking with you earlier that the title is 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 you know it's a little nervous because it's this this concept that we are in constant state of growth, uh, but it is something we have to accept and and grab onto. I, I think I joked with you that you know uh, the old uh, saying I think it was uh, probably an Oscar Wilde that said with with age comes wisdom sometimes uh, uh, age comes by itself, and so hopefully <laughs> we are in a constant state of growth together and on this journey. And I appreciated your partnership and friendship along that line. Oh, uh, me as well. You've been an inspiration to me in my growth. You've been so courageous in so many different ways um, in terms of leaning into what's not easy for you. I mean, I've seen it in real time and you've done such a great job telling stories about that and, and super transparent even with the folks. But I, I love the way you've encouraged others to lean in. I mean, put systems in place to 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 give people the opportunity to lean in, in ways. Well, thanks for that. And, you know, as my wife says, they don't need to know everything about you, honey. But um, to me, that's, 
part of being who I am. It, it's my own therapy, frankly, to get through life every single day. Is, is and, and I'm not smart enough to remember what I told one person or another. So if I just tell the truth all the time and just spill it all out there, then then I'm pretty consistent. And uh, But our journey together has been, been awesome. I, it, it, for the, the people listening to this don't know, we've worked together uh, since I joined the system back in 2013, 2014 as president of University of West Georgia. Uh, brought Keith and his team in together to help us lead through six years of, of leadership development and growth to great success at West Georgia and now at Georgia Southern. And it's been part of my journey and growth. I know, uh, I, at least I want to believe I'm a better president because of it and certainly a better father and husband. Oh my gosh. Uh, thank you. We're honored by those accolades and it's been such a privilege to work with you guys. Um, and, and just the hundreds of amazing leaders that are making, you know, the thing that I always tell them is the thing that makes it such a privilege and an honor to work with people in higher education is you feel like you're investing in people that are investing in people. And it's such a generative process that, that especially at West Georgia, but again, at Georgia Southern, there is the opportunity to actually create generational permanent transformation in families through the work that your faculty and staff are doing in the lives of these students. Well, that's it. And, you know, uh, I love higher education, obviously, it aligns with my passion. Uh, as we look back, and I look back on my career and the through line with that was always impacting others in some way. And so ultimately in higher education, as, as much as it is challenged and disrupted during this time, particularly in the last five or 10 years in its value proposition, it couldn't be more important now for leaders, for the organization to understand its mission, its goals, its primary focus always needs to be the impact on students and growing students and their success but we can't do that if we're stuck in place, if, if we're locked into place and, and not growing ourselves. And so that's really the thrust of the work that we've done together, Keith. And, and I believe that's helped us be successful at both West Georgia and now at Georgia Southern. Yeah, Georgia Southern is, um, I, again, I know that the tagline that you've almost put, I, I don't know if this is university wide or if this is just for the faculty it's and our staff. Vision statement it's for the entire university. Say it yeah. out loud, growing people, purpose, action, growing ourselves to grow others. Our greatest asset is our people. It is our staff, our faculty, our communities, our students, the continued investment uh, and with a purpose to understanding why they're there every day. Uh, it is to impart knowledge, to transfer knowledge, to elevate societies, uh, that purpose, that belief in the transformational power of education, the actions associated with them, the goals within a strategic plan, but it's, really that next phrase that gets to the culture. It's this aspect of self-reflection of growth, that we're in a constant state of growth. Faculty, administrators, we all have to be growing, improving. And it's not just for our own sake, it's for the sake to then grow others, to impact others. So people, purpose, action, growing ourselves to grow others. That's our vision statement. And I'm really proud of that because most higher ed institutions, uh, you know, it's the typical Georgia Southern aspires to be recognized as a national leader in X, Y, and Z. But I really wanted to take a strategic plan and say, the only way a strategic plan is successful is if the culture then drives it to where it becomes part of our actions and behaviors every single day. So that vision statement now, I, I believe you walk around our campus uh, and asked anyone of our 3,350 employees or 27,000 students, they, they've heard it. They may not be able to say it verbatim, but they understand that's what we're driving towards every single day. Oh my gosh. And I love, you know, we talk so much about challenge and contradiction as the fuel for growth. And um, this, I, I want to be a little bit delicate with this, but the, but but you have in your accountability systems and your strategic initiatives and your measurement of people's performance, you've created a system of accountability that has interjected challenge and contradiction into your leaders' lives, whether they want it or not. And well, you know, uh, I think, you know, I'm a musician. So, you know, when people hear the vision and they assume me from a liberal arts background and humanities background, it's very touchy-feely. Uh, but then on the back end of it is massive accountability. 
uh, balanced scorecards. I have one on my leaders. We have that throughout the whole divisional structures. Everything's measured. Uh, 90 day actions in which we hold ourselves accountable for the progress, the updates, the assessment. All that is outward facing on our website. And that really then drives the outcome base, but then at the same time takes the humanity part of it uh, that. You know, look, anyone can be a great leader and have a great vision, but does anyone want to follow that? You have to inspire mm. and help people to see their place in that, meet them where they are, help them to understand their success will be the success not only of them individually as a faculty member, uh, as a staff member, as a student, but the success of the institution. And higher ed is the strangest, probably most broken organizational structure you'd want to, you know, if you wanted to put a, a dysfunctional organizational structure together, you'd probably look at higher ed and say, that's about as good as you can get. Uh, because we have <laughs> <laughs> these incredibly intellectually gifted, uh, talented faculty who are independent contractors, who we judge their, their, their research, scholarly creative activity, their, their service and their teaching individually. And they, they feel like they're on an island, not connected to an institution. That's the natural culture. So what we're driving at is, no, no, you're part in helping us to achieve our goals together. And so it's, it's been a challenge, a, a reward, uh, and a continuous state of, as you said, of growth. We're on this journey together. Uh, and sometimes we even act like adults. So it's really exciting. <laughs> so growth, again, it just comes up over and over again with you. Um, Something clicked in your life, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. uh, what, uh, there, there must have been some periods of growth as you reflect back over the course of your life. What are some significant things that happened that sort of got you on this journey of being so growth focused for not only your people, but for yourself? Well, you know, uh, I, I think I'd have to reflect back early, uh, you know, in my uh, late 20s, mid to late 20s, uh, I, I, I think you know this, all my degrees are in music. Uh, I had a, a pretty active career as a professional opera singer, believe it or not. Uh, San Francisco Opera was a couple of years in Switzerland, uh, you know, uh, was an artistic ambassador for the United States embassies. I had a nice career moving forward. I was very fortunate in my early 20s to, to make many of the elite apprentice programs, make my way to San Francisco Opera, et cetera, and had success. And every time I opened my mouth, people, wow, that's a, that's a great voice. And, and it was almost like an athletic ability uh, mm -hmm. for, for, you know, to, to put some type of correlation in that is, is I had this ability to sing uh, operatically a baritone voice and be able to sound uh, like Robert Merrill was my idol and listen to him and Cheryl Mills and, and I could make those sounds and do it. And I was smart enough with the languages and others. And so I had success early in my twenties at a high level. Uh, and, and when you're just like as an athlete, just a, as a singer in the opera world, when things are working, when these two pieces of meat in your throat are coming together, every day's your birthday. Everybody loves you. You're wonderful. Oh, we love Kyle. He's great. This, so it becomes this, valuation of yourself based on an athletic ability, right? And, and that is a falsehood, that's an idol in many ways. And, and so really, as I made it through my 20s, that was who I was. I was the person who made every audition, uh, was you know having a great career in my mid 20s. And I late, about 27, 28 years old, uh, and this was like late 80s, uh, early 90s, uh, they hadn't diagnosed reflux, but I had a terrible case of reflux. I was waking up hoarse every morning, I ended up with scar, you know, having scar tissue on my arytenoid cartilages and basically having a posterior gap, more information than you ever want to know on my vocal folds. And so my voice wasn't working the way it did. And that same look on people's face when I sang before uh, was not there anymore. It was like, well, what's happened to this guy's voice? And oh, very wow. much like an athlete who starts to lose something, a step or whatever it may be, or an injury, it was that some, same valuation. And so for me, it was a point of a precipice of, okay, goodness, do I want to rely on two pieces of meat in my throat the rest of my life? What, you know, who am I? What are my valuations? What is it what does it mean for, for me to move forward in this life uh, to feel like I have purpose, direction, if this is taken away? Uh, that was such a big part of my identity. And that really set me on a path. And I was just so blessed and fortunate to have a great mentor and teacher, George Shirley at University of Michigan, 
who uh, one of the first African Americans to sing at the Met, just an incredible man and mentor. And he really helped me psychologically get through this and said, you know, Kyle, you aren't your voice. You're this person who has many gifts, intellectual abilities, leadership abilities, uh, things to the way in which you communicate that you could do anything you set your mind to. And here I was a trained musician finishing my doctorate. So I decided teaching and that really became a passion and that was a connection to academia. And then other things opened up in administration. I began running some opera companies, so I still stayed tied into that, but then really started to see skill sets and ability of growth to be adapted and adopted in a career path, still using the same talents. But, you know, it's like anything. I mean, I use this analogy. I've heard this before, so I, I stole it from somebody. I can't remember who, but it's, it's like sailing when you, you know, you look back at my life at 57 now, back to how did I start off being a professional opera singer and how in the world did I become a, a university president? Uh, you know, you look back and it's like sailing. If you want to get from point A to B, you, you rarely can go direct, right? If you're going against the wind, you're, you're, you're tacking back and forth, back and forth, back and forth uh, to all these little career moves. But then when you look back, what was the through line of, of purpose, of passion, of alignment? And it was always to impact others, whether that impact that I had when I was on the stage singing, uh, that I could elevate for that moment the quality of people's life, uh, to forget their troubles, whatever that might be, to then being able to be in different positions throughout my life and career. That's what I look back now and go, that, that's the line. That, that's what helped me through that. And, and I was at a point where if I had not made those decisions and had the courage to go to other doors uh, that opened, uh, then I wouldn't be here today. And so my encouragement is, you know, don't look at, sometimes we see these challenges in our lives of, oh my goodness, I'm not gonna be the person I thought I was gonna be. This is being taken away from me. It's the outside in, in, you know, what the world has done to me and how, how am I gonna move forward became this, everything opened up and everything was possible. And, uh, but the through line was always, this is the legacy that I want is to impact others. And so anything I can do, whether it's, you know, digging ditches, or running universities, I can do that with that same purpose and goal. So that, oh. that's, you know, that's what got me through that time. Um, and then I got another one for you if you want well, one. But, hang, but, yeah. hang, hang, on for, hang on for one second, because I mean, that you, you just captured our curriculum in a story. <laughs> I mean, it was the move from outside in to inside out. It was the help of not of another not doing this alone, right? You, there, there was this mentor that you had that really pointed you toward who are you going to be? I love the phrase adapt and adopt, yeah. right? That, that, it's, that, uh, that I've got to change, but also we don't talk about this much on this podcast, but time is a component of our growth. And, um, and sometimes we don't get to see the through line it, until some time has passed, until we've tacked a couple yeah. of times to stay with the sailing analogy for a minute. But the, but uh, uh, I mean, just beautiful. And then the challenge and contradiction. You've never told me that story about oh, about about the reflux. Yeah. And and uh, and I've also never heard two pieces of meat in your throat. But I, I hope the whole <laughs> audience can let that go for just a minute. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, but that was so good. So. Yeah. Com oh, comment. Yes, I'd love to hear. Well, you know, and, and I think, you know, if I were to share further on that, it was then just the incredible blessing that, that you know, God placed Jane in my life, who the minute I heard her sing, it was like, okay, this is what a singer needs to sound like. It was so just part of her very existence. I was always a very technical singer. I know that's a big surprise to you. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and I worried about it and I kvetched about it and everything. Jane just sings and it's just part of her existence. And so, you know, that was also such a gift to me to have a partner that, that, that supported new avenues where I could then still be a part of a life where she was connected to what I did before. But, you know, I'm so thankful for that. I don't know where I'd be today if, if not for that obstacle or that challenge, but you're so right. It's perseverance, time, 
and, and addressing the challenge in a way that you get to the center core of your values of what you want to stand for. Wow. And how did you, I mean, I think you already said it maybe, but this arriving at the, the center core of your values, the, the through line, the legacy, the destination, you used a lot of words in there. Um, I was, was that awareness there from the beginning? Did it grow in you through this set of experiences? How did that, how did that sort of awareness come about? Because the true North allows us to deal with challenge and contradiction in a different way. But how did this, I, I, you didn't use the word true North, but how did the true North c come into being for you? Can you talk a little bit about how that emerged in your life? And was it an epiphany or was it a, was it an unfolding or was it a, 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 a big direction that got refined over time? What, what, speak to that if you don't mind. Yeah, and it's certainly the vocabulary that, that we're speaking now wasn't there, you know, to understand that or be able to even communicate it in, in any way uh, that, that, you know, in the words we're using now, that's been developed, obviously, through through leadership, et cetera. But, but you know, for me, and, and without giving my testimony, you know, I have to refer to my faith. I mean, the center core of that and, and, and imparting that is every part of my being and, and really you know, investing in my, 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 my biblical uh, and, and my relationship with my Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. And I, I know this is a secular program, but I have to say that because that's every part of the core being of who I am and what I believe in. But, you know, what's really been so such an incredible opportunity in my life through this particularly you think about it in the arts world, in the opera world, and in the higher ed world is the world. And, and so all of these values are translated into secular being and what it is in terms of, of how do I treat others how I'd like to be treated? How, how do I invest in others in a way that I can, they can be the best iterations of themselves? That was a through line that, that I, you know, I don't know if that was a, a gift or, or, or just something, a passion. Uh, that was my default. I mean, uh, from, from an early age that, that you know, I, I always was sympathetic, sympathetic, and wanted to help uh, uh, others in need in some way. And then to be able to organize that, develop that, to be put in positions to have, a, have a authority, uh, you know, overwhelming as that may be, uh, gave great opportunity. The other factor that, and I think it's my art, the artistic upbringing, you got to understand as a singer, you have 10 auditions if you get one gig out of it you're a successful singer so you're 90 percent failure rate and everything you do on the stage is criticized in writing but you still have to get up there and perform even if they said you were horrific and, and still have the matinee performance on sunday to get up and do again after you just read about how terrible you were so uh, that gave me a really thick skin a sensitivity uh to want to have impact yet ability to Oh well, that sucked. I better try something else. You know, so my ability to 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 jump into the pool and fail and and thrash around and jump back out and go, okay, I'm not going to do it that way again. I was able to iterate, you know, assess, improve, and try again, and and pretty much let that go. And so that was my artistic background that let me iterate through each of the growth opportunities and find out what I was good at and not beat myself up if it happened to be a, a complete failure. Uh, and that's, you know, to my leadership team, please forgive me, but that's sort of how I lead a university. It's like, look, if we don't try, we'll never know. And we got to give this a go. And then we, we quickly assess our failure so we can move forward, but we don't dwell on it. And I think if we can get organizations to move in that way, we can get a lot more innovation happening, particularly in higher education. Oh my gosh, and it's so needed, especially in that environment. Um, yeah. uh, I, I love, you know, there are better and worse influences early in our lives, right? Yeah. And having a faith underpinning, I think there are probably destructive versions of that, but there's an awful lot of positive that comes. But I love the way that you phrased um, in the middle of that last segment a series of questions that were, that all started with sort of, how do I? How do I, how do I do this? How, what am I going to be? It was a, those kinds of things. And it's interesting to me 
that you could turn outward and say, tell me that from the outside, but, but, but usually those questions demand an inside out answer. And if we're willing to ask ourselves those questions, a groundedness comes out of that. So those questions are so important. Yeah. Um, well, tell me the uh, tell me the second story. I got to know it now. I know we're going to well, be pressed for time before this is all over. But it but but let's see what happens. This is one that that's you know I've I've shared in, in investiture speeches and others uh, opportunities to talk. Is and and I I think I've told you this story, Keith. If I, I haven't, I, I apologize. My mother, who you know really was my stalwart, and I'm a big mama's boy, you know, and proudly say that, and and just one of the great people that I've known in, in my life in every way. Uh, she passed away uh, April 15, 2014, uh, but on May 19, uh, 2000, uh, you know, I was 37 years old, uh, get a call, rollover car accident, uh, instant quadriplegic, uh, and other than a doctor pulling up right behind the accident to keep her alive, 18 months in ICU, uh, we get her home, she lives uh, as long as anyone has lived with a C2 vertebrae, uh, injury, uh, basically uh, ventilator dependent, quadriplegic, uh, had swallow mechanism off and on throughout that time, uh, but survived. And and her spirit, her her impact on others was just transformational to me. I mean, uh, you know, at her at her passing, you know, at the service, there were hundreds of nurses and doctors who, through all her years of care, came. And their story was com was consistent throughout. She made my day every time. I was so excited to be assigned to or to to check on her or to 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 be part of her care because uh, every day she awoke with this in her saying. And and uh, I even have it. Excuse me. And had it put on wood here. Is it's all good. And her ability to get through life and see every single day as a gift, uh, to be gracious for it and the gratitude. And then, you know, I always tease her, I said, you're sort of the, the, the uh, uh, Mrs. Rogers. I mean, she just, you know, had this way of anyone that came in and visited or when we would see her or be there with family to, to bring you in that you were the most special person at that moment to be conversing with. And, and that joy, that, that gift that she shared, uh, I mean, you know, just, just became an example to me of quit your darn complaining. What do you have to complain about, Marrero? You know, your life is a blessing. Every bit of it, every day, every obstacle, every challenge is nothing. You don't, you know, you're able to feed yourself. You're able to breathe on your own, you're, you know. And, and she treated every day that it was that, it, you know, that it was this opportunity to impact others. And so that was just such a, you know, and it was a difficult time. I'm not trying to sugarcoat it. I mean, you know, family was forced together to make this all work, the finances of it, everything, you know, you can imagine all the, the that around all that, that made it difficult, but the, uh, you know, the testimony, uh, the experience, and the impact on my life moving forward, and what uh, anything that comes in our lives in this journey, um, you know, just just has helped me uh, to put things into perspective. Whether it's dealing with COVID nineteen or everything else, uh, to understand uh, that every day has the opportunity to impact somebody. It doesn't it doesn't matter what challenges are before you. So to me, that's probably you know it, it's one that I, I I reflect on a lot and has meant so much uh, as a legacy. Uh, you know, if your mother uh, can can have a legacy, Mr. Rogers, I, I remember you know, sharing that in one of the sessions that you gave us when he said, you know, take that moment and, and think of the people that have uh, uh, breathed, uh, you know, life and hope into you that have made you who you are. And that's, you know, that's my mom. And so uh, there's not a day goes by that I don't reflect on, on her and how she adapts and, and, and gets through, got through her time. And so I just want to share that with you because that, that really, you know, at 37 years old and then through uh, her passing in 2014, you know, at 51, um, that's for me, my, you know, uh, what will carry me to the grave. Oh, what a powerful story. Um, what, 
when you reflect, you, you um, again, I, I haven't noticed this in previous podcasts, but you raised another key question again that demanded an answer from you. And the question in that last segment was, what do you have to complain about, Marrero? Yeah. Right? And, it, and, and, and that contextualizes things. It puts it in perspective. It's all good, right? Um, when you reflect, and, and every time you sit at your desk and look at that shelf, there's that sign, it's all good, right? But it's, um, when you reflect, what is the byproduct? of the reflection for you most times, because again, reflection is so meaningful in our growth, because again, most reflection demands an inside out answer. It demands a new sense of groundedness. So for you, what is that? I'm curious. Well, you know, look, uh, you, you, you've you gotten to know me. You also know that I, 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 I like things, you know, like I'm set, I like our plan. Let's execute our plan. We'll assess as we go, you know, some might say I'm a little bit of a control freak, but but I've gotten a lot better at that. And this that's you know when I pressed into during that time, particularly with my mom, I you know there was no control there. You know this was you know uh, she was she, days she would may live, days she may not live. I mean I remember you know my mom you know because I'm you know I got a little bit of worry wart, a little risk assessment in me. I should have been an insurance claims adjuster or something, but um you know. Uh, we got her a van and a wheelchair and the whole bit, and she wanted to go out, you know, and I'm like, my mom, you know, maybe we shouldn't go out today, you know, uh, battery's not maybe fully charged, this, da, da, da. She just looked at me and go, what, I'm going to die? You know, get over it. Come on, let's go, you know, and, and so uh, she really made me press beyond the fear, the worries, the fears that res keeps a resistant of, of change or growth or pressing into things that are hard or uncomfortable. Um, yeah. I mean, she, you know, that's, you know, so as I grew through that and reflected on it, it was really that, you know, tackle those worries and fears and resistance, because if you don't, you know, where are you going to live in a house, uh, in a bed, on a ventilator, you know, and, and not experience any of the world? And so that was that contradiction for me of seeing that played out right in front of me and then pressing into what's that going to mean? How are you going to change, Kyle, and grow from this? And, 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 uh, and so, you know, you know, my wife says sometimes I'm fearless that I scare her because I'll, I'm like, let's do it. Let's go, you know, or I, I'm, I'm, pretty decisive and 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 you know but it is because of that growth opportunity from that experience that you know what's the worst that can happen you know i mean not to do foolish things clearly but but it is this opportunity in life to embrace it fully and and uh again not be afraid of failure uh but give it your all i mean no one outworks me My, you know that's that's uh you know uh, i'm never going to be outworked uh, uh, so that's never the issue. It is more, you know, along this journey, uh, if you don't open yourself up and try, uh, you, you know, you, you, and, and you live in fear or worry, uh, you will never grow and you won't impact people to the level of which you may desire. So yeah. that's, that's what I learned from that uh, really. Wow. And, and, and it's look, look, Keith, I, you know, it's not like I'm 57. It's not like I got it all together. There's days I struggle like everybody. I mean, this last year has been overwhelming. You know, there is no, there is no playbook uh, to run a 27,000 student institution on three campuses with 3,000 employees in a worldwide pandemic, you know. Uh, so, you know, there's, <laughs> you know, three o'clock. I might as well just, you know, have a little alarm because I wake up at three going, okay. All right, you know, what have I forgotten? What's going on? And so, you know, uh, but if not for the life experiences that I, I shared with you and, and, and the perspective around that, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd be a lot grayer than I am right now just in the last six months, that's for sure. Oh my gosh, uh, I, I wish I had known your mother. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what a special person. And, and, and how important is it almost if you don't, I mean, um, there was a 
you're saying there was a blessing or a silver lining even in in what happened nobody wants that to happen to anybody but how special is it to have that kind of person in your world and, and as an encouragement to others maybe even who is that person in my world right that can have that kind of influence on me is maybe an important question what is it now Kyle, what's what's going on now? What are you bumping up against? I mean, you're right. There's no playbook for 2020. You've had book burnings. You've got students. You've got faculty. You've got COVID. You've got social unrest. You've got racial tension. I mean, it's all going on in your world. What what? But and, but what are you bumping up against right now? Like, where's your greatest opportunity for growth? Do you think when you think about it? I need a drink of water before I answer that one. Okay, uh, good. No, so, um, you know, it has been an extraordinary year. Now, you know, I, I, you and I have talked often, particularly in the last four or five years, you know, that, that uh, higher education was probably being, uh, you know, the most question it had ever been in terms of its relevance, its return on investment, et cetera. And if we didn't adapt and change and innovate, you know, we, we are in danger of this disruption really making us obsolete. So now you throw in the urgency of all of you know, the racial, social unrest, uh, particularly. I mean, you know, everyone needs to think of particularly a public university of our size, largesse and diversity. You put a lens over that and times it by 10. You know, this, this is we're a hotbed and always have been in higher education of political, racial, uh, social equity, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, and so this all heightened right in the midst of the pandemic, planning on that and working towards how can we reopen in an environment uh, and with the safety protocols, et cetera. So put that in then budget cuts because revenue collection in the state uh, was coming uh, basically from the shutdown. 10.8% uh, budget cuts uh, to all of the university system institutions, the University System of Georgia. So facing that, trying to do it without lay layoffs, trying to do it to protect our people as a center part of our uh, vision statement and our ability to move forward, our promise to our students. And then, you know, uh, safety levels, uh, protocols, healthcare protocols of which none of us have dealt with, I mean, uh, in higher education. And so incredible learning curve, an incredible opportunity to put into place operational aspects, uh, contact tracing, notification, isolation, quarantine areas, testing, all the protocols, the PPE, everything within the classroom, mapping out the classes, adjusting 5,000 courses, working through all that was an exercise. But, but you know what, Kate, the coolest thing, the coolest thing about all this is at the center of it, what's your mission? Our mission is to deliver quality education to our, to our students and continue to transform their lives. Then clearly we've got to protect the safety protocols, healthcare of our, our workforce, et cetera, and financial sustainability through this so we can weather all of this. Those are really the three things. And so I try to make it really simple in the communication so we could all work together towards that. And then the neatest thing that, that all the work we did at West Georgia, all the work that we've done here with a strategic plan was to say, what are our values? What are our values as an institution? Well, let's look back at those and let's lead from our values to the outcomes we desire. And as we did that, it became more and more on board with our faculty, with our staff, through everything to understand their part in this, how we'd protect them, how we'd get through this together and it hasn't been perfect um you know as as many of the public institutions we had an uptick the second week but we managed it brought it back down and we've made it through and we've been averaging in the teens per week with thirty thousand human beings that's been unbelievable and and so you know at the center of it again is what are the principal goals and outcomes but then the values i think where we get in trouble particularly in leadership and higher education and others, is we look to the outcomes, we measure the outcomes, we drive to the outcomes. And then we forget, how did we get there? Because you have to lead from your values through any, whether it's good times or bad times. Because if you dispense your values, you've lost it all. It doesn't matter if you're successful, because not many people will be happy or feel like mm -hmm. they were part of that process. And, and I never want to forget, again, I go back to people, um, without the people, 
we're, we're nothing. They have to see their part in this. They, they have to they feel engaged, the, the, the humanity aspect of it. It doesn't matter how good your plan is if there's not buying, if they don't see themselves in that or the success both individually and corporately, it isn't gonna be successful. It's not gonna be sustainable anyway. Uh, so that's, that's how we've gotten through it as the hardest times and it's continuing. You know, it's not like just because this semester is almost over, it's going to continue until the vaccine, until we have some type of uh, mass uh, immunity. Uh, and that's going to be six to eight months, nine months, 12 months, perhaps. So it'll continue. But the way we've gotten through it is our values that then extend and result in the outcomes. So does that help? Does that help allay any of the what we talk about is worry, fear, resistance, the things that if I take this step, if I lead in this way, I'm going to, do, are you at a point in your life where you are more keenly aware or, or it's not there as much? What, what is the, what do you, what do you have to bump up against to keep the institution and all of these people focused on where you're going? What's the, what, in other, in a different way to ask the question is what's hardest for you? in leading that way. And if you don't want to answer the question, I totally respect that. No, look, and 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 I'll always be honest, like I, like I am with you, of course, you know, I have fears and worries with this, you know, this is, this is not to, to add hyperbole, but it is life and death. You know, it oh, isn't wow. just education anymore. Uh, you really have the well-being of human beings involved in yeah. the decision-making and implementation of what you're doing uh, in this COVID environment. Um, and so, yes, of course, uh, you know, there's, there's moments where I go, oh my goodness, are, are we doing the right thing? But what I can tell you is as through that, as we move through it and the values again and leading it and assessing and quickly adapting, again, I'll go back to the fail quickly, assess, improve, and be, be okay. The second week, Second week, we had 508 cases on our campus. Uh, now it's still a very large campus, so you know it, it was, but it was certainly an alert. It was we got to do something. Uh, contact tracing, we're getting behind in. So we quickly admitted it, assessed it, improved it within 10 days, and back on track and got everything down. And I think that's where, it, particularly government agencies, others, frankly, get in trouble is they aren't they aren't quick to say, okay, that wasn't great. We're going to improve now. This is what we're doing and transparently talk about it. And that's what got us through. Now, I'd be lying to tell you that everybody thinks everything's wonderful. Of course they don't. We're, we're higher at institution. I mean, you know, uh, but there's part, you know, I love it because it's like going to a rehearsal. It's back to my artistic life. If all the artists I was working with in Aida production thought I, I was wonderful as the director and we were all heading in the right direction uh, for the production, no. But what I learned in that experience was to take the collective intellect of everybody, you have your vision, but then integrate them and help them be part of that solutions of where it can go and be engaged in that, taking it all in, see, let them see their part in what you're doing, still driving it, still making the decisions because you're hired to be the leader. But that engagement aspect of it at the end of the day probably makes it better than anything you could have thought up or come up with yourself. Certainly, because the collective intellect is always going to be stronger when it's harnessed and focused than a singular leader coming up with, with exactly what should happen. Um, that helped us through it and has gotten most on board. Uh, you know, the other part of leadership, if you want some advice, is if you're leading, you aren't going to make everybody happy. You just aren't. And at some point, you have to be able to put your head on the pillow and go, I have been honest, transparent truthful and in this i have taken in to account uh, all the considerations and have done the very best i can and admit when it fails and move quickly to the next solution so oh. so that's you know uh you know it's the old 80 20 rule if you got 80 percent on board you're doing really really well as a, as a large organization and and that's our goal uh, really as yeah. we move forward yeah, oh, that's so good. Uh, there's so much in that. Um, you may have just answered the question in the last uh, in that last couple of sentences, but but what is your advice to younger leaders on the journey to people who are not where you are yet, but that um, you, you know see potential in themselves? What 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 do you what do you how do you like to counsel those 
that you get to have counsel with? Well, you know, you can't be afraid of failure. I know I'm repeating myself, but that's critical. I think that that holds so many people in place, particularly leaders, because no yeah. one, you know, uh, no one wants to to appear weak, uh, out of control, or 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 in some way incapable. You know, that's just not a human condition or emotion any of us want to feel. Um, but that vulnerability, particularly in the leadership aspect, uh, to be able to, to help your team collectively be the best iterations of themselves as a team is only going to strengthen the organization. And if you're, if you're looking at it just to make yourself look better, <clears throat> you'll never be successful. And, and frankly, the, the, the organization will be more successful if you elevate everybody, their greatest opportunity for success. So, so have courage um you know be open uh to new ideas even if they aren't your own uh don't try to be the smartest person in the room in fact that's probably the worst thing you can be uh in some even if even if you maybe have a better idea than somebody else you know the old joke is you never know who might have a good day so let and make sure everybody has the opportunity to engage uh but also you know particularly within your leadership teams, when they see that you value their input, their engagement, they'll be more apt to be thinking creatively, wanting to bring new ideas. Uh, and so that's, you know, and I get this, it's interesting that you, you ask this question because I, I talk a lot to our student government leadership. And, you know, a typical 18 to 22 year old that has just moved into a leadership position, whether it's student government president, vice president, one of the executive teams, et cetera, you know, they'll say, well, here's my vision, here's my plan. And then six months later, I couldn't get anyone to do all the things I wanted to do. They made it fail. Well, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, it might've been the best plan in the world, the greatest vision in the world, and that you just delegated it all and said, do this. And it's all, you know, until they see themselves in that part or a part of that or feel engaged and can see their contribution or even their ideas in it, they're gonna give you 100%. Uh, and delegating is not getting a task done. They have to understand the why. Why am I doing this? Why is it important? Uh, how does it help me and the institution or whatever you're governing? So um, communication is another, you know, I, I can't, uh, even if it feels like you're over communicating and uh, you know, you have to find every way to communicate. It's not just email. It's not just verbal. It's not just, you know, but you have to invest in one-on-ones and really get to know the people that work with you and take that opportunity to understand what they want, what their desires are. So, um, you know, and that takes time and not everybody wants to take that. But if my, my advice to any young leader making their way up through uh, and that is that that has you know aspirations or ambitions is uh, the the more that you help others to become the best iteration of themselves around uh, of which you work in your environment, uh, those incredible opportunities will come to you. You won't even have to uh, apply or or uh, or be interviewed because people will be coming to you. It'll shed more light on you as being a great leader, the more selfless you are in that aspect. Oh my gosh, Kyle, um, I want to encourage any up and coming listeners to go to the transcript, pick up those last five minutes, look at every word that was just said and start asking yourself the question, what does that mean for me? Um, I was just brilliant. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I just think there was so much humility. There was so much level fiveness as we talk about it in that, in terms of just seeing the bigger picture and rising above the different points of view, but how do you knit things together instead of just manage the differences? Folks, we're making the transcript available. If not, just back up and listen to the last six minutes 10 times. Take your own notes. Thank you. Hey, what are you most, we, we got to wrap this up pretty soon, but what, what are you most excited about in your world right now? What's going on that you're just pumped about that is, is working that you want folks to know about? 
Well, look, Georgia Southern, you know, uh, has been through a lot in the last uh, three, four years, consolidation, bringing together cultures of multiple campuses with great heritage and pride and legacy in different communities in Southeast Georgia. Uh, we've really moved forward in that, really cast the vision of what the collective uh, uh, opportunity is within a regional concept. Uh, the areas of logistics IT tech we're going to be leaders in both from a, a public impact research opportunity and talent development for the region with 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 uh, uh, you know uh, Savannah being one of the largest ports in North America uh, that's going to be a great opportunity for us we had record enrollment uh, for our freshman class in the history of the institution uh, up 32 percent in one in the year. middle of COVID yeah, yeah, kind of terrifying, huh? But, <laughs> you know, that was a year of really putting in a strategic enrollment plan, marketing and driving that and telling our story, because if you don't tell your own story, others will replace what they believe you are. And we did a great job on that collectively, the team did, and, and we saw the fruits of that labor. Uh, record faculty uh, research last year, uh, and we're doing well again this year. Uh, record graduation rates, four and six year graduation rates in the history of the institution. So, you know, even in the midst of COVID, focusing on our values, leading from our values with the plan, with the accountability structure, investing in our people so they see their place in it, we're seeing successes that were part of our strategic plan. And in spite of COVID, in spite of budget cuts, in spite of social and racial unrest, we're moving forward. And then the last point that I'm really proud of is our, our you know, uh, we're in the South, we're at Georgia Southern, we've had a history here of racial issues and incidents on our campus. And we've really tackled that head on transparently, openly, and said, you know, this is what we are not good at. And this is what we're going to improve. And we've mapped that out in an inclusive excellence action plan, accountability, a climate survey, uh, and key performance indicators that will drive us forward in an environment where I believe we can be really proud of where everyone has the opportunity to be successful here at this institution. So, so those are the exciting things in my mind, even in spite of COVID, in spite of all that's happening around us, uh, we're, we're finding success. And I'll finish where I started. It, 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 it isn't just because we said we're going to do it. It isn't just because we, we put measurements out there that we're trying to obtain. It's we've invested in our people, in their constant development and growth, and they're the ones that are making it happen. You know, not me. They're doing it. And that's wow. the that's the greatest part about being president of Georgia Southern right now. Uh, so well said. Do they um, if people want to learn more about the institution, they go to georgiasouthern.com or is it the website edu, different than that? georgiasouthern.edu and okay. uh, find everything about it. Uh, and then if they perfect specifically around what we're doing, Keith, with Leaders Lyceum, uh, with uh, Suter Education, uh, through our what we call uh, performance excellence, which is evidence-based leadership of culture high performance, everything we talked about. We put that all transparently outward. You can see our uh, scorecards, action plans, philosophy around everything we're trying to do. Oh my gosh. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this is why I said at the beginning of the podcast, this is the most progressive, innovative, game-changing, transformational leader in higher education right now. Kyle, others are paying attention to this. Selfishly, as a longtime resident of the state of Georgia, I kind of wish we could just boundary this so that uh, we don't get some, a board from another institution saying, hey, why don't we see if we can get him? I want you here for our people, but that's yeah. totally selfish. Yeah. Anyway, God bless you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for spending time, for sharing your insights, your wisdom. It's all good. I love it. All Dr. Right. Kyle Marrero, thank you so much. God bless you, Keith. Love you, ma'am. All right. You too. Thank Take you, care, my friend. Oh my goodness, Keith. How fun was your conversation with Kyle Marrero? His he, energy levels a sight to behold, is it not? Oh my gosh. He is just <laughs> contagious with goodwill and optimism and I mean, I just hearing the story about his mother, it just all made sense. But he really is one of those people that it's just a joy to be around. And um, I love that we got to bring his story to our listeners. There were so many good things in this conversation. I always try to take notes, right, as I'm listening, because I want to have things to talk about and comment on. And I had to pause your conversation with him so many times because there was so much good stuff. Um, 
And I just, a, a couple things that I think were so important and that, again, a thread that we find in so many of these conversations, it came out um, in our conversation with Dale most recently, but this idea of like, where do you where do you find your identity right and he talked about losing his ability to sing opera at such a young age and his mentor made the comment you aren't your voice and when your yeah. success and your identity has been so strongly connected to that for your you know early professional life to lose that it really is um a a, a life challenging opportunity i mean i had an opportunity like that an opportunity. It was not an opportunity in real time. A challenge like that where early on, you know, first thing out of grad school, my first job, I was laid off and I'm like, wait a second, what? I'm not, let me just be blunt. I was fired. And that like, when you lose what you do as your identity is like, oh, I didn't realize how important that was to me. And for him to lose that through opera, I think um, was really a growth opportunity for him and really identifying what he, he cared about. And it was so clear and he said it from the beginning and he repeated it throughout that his life is about impacting others. And whether he's doing that by singing opera, by leading a theater company or by leading a university, what can I do to keep impacting others? And I think when people face challenges and i know these this past year has brought so many challenges for people is to really look at who are you what are the things that really matter to you that that you want to be your source of identity bringing those more internal to you so that whatever happens outside of you is not going to shake that i think kyle is such a great example of that yeah and just to build on that a little bit sarah i think um you know you know how much I love the explanatory or contextualizing power of the bell curve, the normal distribution. <laughs> oh, you love the bell curve. I know sometimes too much, but the, but um, you know, Kyle is one of these people that for whatever reason was born, I think with almost an innate capacity to grow well. I mean, you, you know, you just, everybody just heard the story and it's like through every step of the way, um, he, he's done that. But I think the thing that we can take away from this and the thing that, that we can learn is that, is that you don't get to a place where you can talk so easily about the impact that you want to have on others and what you want to be and how you hold yourself in place and what worry, fear, and resistance you need to battle against to get to where you want to go without kind of doing this on purpose. Most of us, the reality is, is most of us need help in, in doing that. And Kyle's ability to um, kind of know who he wants to be is something that we can do. We can evaluate what are those things. You, you know, your identity in an opera singer is, he, he mentioned this, it's almost like being a professional athlete, right? And if you're a professional athlete or if you're a professional opera singer, it's so easy to see that our identity might be wrapped up in that. It is harder for those of us that don't sit out again in that tail um, of the distribution. But we've got things that we're getting our identity through that are a lot of times not so obvious and not so easy to put our finger on. Right. And, and yet, as you just said, the importance of us figuring out what are those things that are trying to define us or worse that we're allowing to define us. Yeah. Right. Can we name them and who do we want to be? Yeah. So good. I think one of the phrases that Kyle said that I just loved was that um, we have to lead from our values right? And with all the things that came their way and all the challenges that they're facing in 2020, it wasn't how do we get to our objectives? It was how do we lead from our values yeah. in pursuit of those objectives, right? And it was yeah. about the quality education for his students. It was about protecting his people. Um, and then that just helps 
that just helps you make those decisions. And, and when people don't like the decisions you make, right? He talks about how there's always going to be somebody who doesn't like your decision. When you're leading from those values, you can lay down at, at night and rest because you know why you did what you did. You know you were moving in the right direction. And I just think that is something that we should all aspire towards is really being grounded in those values, knowing what they are, knowing what matters, leading from those and not just leading to an objective. Yeah, such an important point, Sarah, having that be our lens, just the way that we wind up see the wor seeing the world is not easy. Uh, we don't really see it in leaders until they're further along on the developmental journey a little bit for it to be, that's just how they understand the world. However, all of us can start focusing on what should those values be for us? How am I going to own those in the way that Kyle owns those values and the way Dale showed that he owns those values, right? And, it, and again, so much of this winds up going back for us is that, is that we've got to be intentional. We've got to make space. We've got to reflect. And, and reflection takes time, right? And so, and so how can we put ourselves in a position to actually name what these things are for us, right? Name the things that are holding us in place. Name the things that we want to be about. Name the things that are going to be preeminent if life comes off the rails, which, I mean, both the story of the opera and his voice giving way and the story of his mother, are that's life coming off the rails, right? And it's... Yeah. Um, and, and it's what what holds you on the what holds you on the tracks. That's it's the it's the values. It's that that becomes the true north in so many ways. Yeah. And Keith, we didn't talk about this before we uh, started recording this podcast. But one resource that we have found useful and that we use with a lot of our clients are um, value card sorts. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you can recall offhand. We can put the link in the notes, but they're available out just do an internet search of value card sorts. And there's lists of words that can help spark your thinking about this idea where you can kind of go through some exercises of how to identify the things that you really do care about the most that you want to be priorities in your life, that you want your decisions and your influence to, to move in those directions. And so um, finding a resource yeah. like that, I think can be really helpful to our listeners. Yeah. I mean, because what's going to happen is we are going to bump up against challenges, maybe even in 2021. Oh. Who knows? I think we might have used up all of our challenges in 2020. <laughs> but even in 2021, we may bump up against things. And it's so interesting when you've done a value card sort, when you've determined what are the top four or five things I really want to be about, it creates uh, an evaluation point to say, oh, am I going to be this reactive am I just going to react in kind of how I am or do I want to live into this? And, um, you know, just on the heels of this conversation with Kyle, he's such an exemplar of what that can look like to live into the you that you want to be, even when things aren't going the way that you hope that they would go. Yeah. And there's one other thing in his interview that I loved that I was not anticipating coming from him. Um, and it kind of tees up something I want to do in a future episode or, um, several episodes on the podcast is when he talked about this idea of not being afraid to try things and fail and learn from that. And he, he mm -hmm. talked about it early on in the interview. And then he talked about it again in his advice to up and coming leaders is this, don't be a, afraid to fail, but iterate, assess and improve. Right. And it goes back to what we talked about in our last podcast with this idea of small steps and experiments is if you live under this pressure that you have to get it right the first time, that failure is devastating and threatening to you, and you're just not going to be able to grow because you're going to be hindered by that fear. And Kyle, leading a large institution, is saying, all right, I may not get this right, but we've got to try something. And we're going to try it. We're going to admit when it doesn't work, we're going to say, all right, guys, what can we learn from this? What can we do over again? And that's that same principle we talked about with the small steps. And I think there's a lot we can learn 
from that process. Um, and I use it in some of the work that we do in the context of design thinking and innovation and how those principles apply to, apply to leadership. And um, I do want to go deeper with that on another podcast. I just love that Kyle brought it up with this openness and transparency and vulnerability that I think so many leaders are scared of, but it's like, let's just try something. Let's see. And let's, let's learn from it and let's get better. And, and with that, the humility to say, I love the phrase he used at the end was don't try to be the smartest person in the room, like lean on that collective intelligence um, to say what we can come up with together is better than anything I can do. But that requires a humility that again, I think can be threatening to some leaders to go in and say, help me help. Like, let's, let, let me hear what you have to think about it. I'll still take responsibility for the final decision, but I'm not going to pretend that I know the best answer in these unknown situations. And I love that about Kyle. Yeah. And again, um, he has gotten to the point in his journey growing as a grown up that this is, you could hear it in the way that he said it. This is just the way he sees the world now. Yeah. He sees the world in terms of, sort of embracing and loving and leaning into failure so much so that that comment went by in just a flash and we didn't even spend any time on it. But the, Sarah, the thing that I love about what we're trying to do with this podcast is that we can do these things intentionally. We can decide that I'm not going to be scared of failure on this thing this time, right? Mm -hmm. What did I learn new about me from trying that and doing it? And and that is how the lens grows. That's how we ultimately wind up seeing the world and not just trying to do the world, right? We see it differently in new ways. We're not just trying to make ourselves do things that will be effective, but by doing the things that we think will be effective, it allows us to change the lens and keep growing as a grown up. Mm -hmm. So we've talked so often, Sarah, about all the resources available at growinggrownups.com. Folks can go there, start with the growth, growth Gap Tool, look at some of the other offerings that we have out there. By the way, Sarah, I think it will be next Friday, this coming Friday. Friday. Yeah, this coming Friday. On the 22nd, we are going to do, uh, we would love to have you join us for a live webinar that we're going to do for an hour on using the Growth Gap Tool. If you didn't hear us talk about that much, we covered it a lot at the end of the last podcast go back and listen to that, the, the one that Sarah and I just did about New Year's resolutions. But um, folks, we hope you enjoyed this one. I know we sure did. Yeah. Have a great week. We'll see you soon. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Growing as Grownups. Take a second and subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any future episodes and tell your friends. You'll find all of the goods related to this episode, including the transcript videos, links, and other ways we can help you keep growing as a grown-up on our website, growinggrownups.com. Growth isn't easy, but it's completely within your reach. Until next time, journey well, friends.